Hello and welcome dear students. Today we are going to talk about landmarks in the history of genetics. The main objectives of today's lecture are to know about the basics of genetics, to know about the history of genetics, to know about the contribution of various scientists in the field of genetics, to know about the rediscovery of Mendel's work and finally to discuss about the Nobel laureates in the field of genetics. Dear students, let's first go for the introduction. Genetics is the science of heredity and variations. On one hand, heredity is the biological process of transferring genetic information and physical traits from parents to their offsprings. The term heredity which comes from the Latin word hereditatum which means condition of being and here was first used in the 1530s. The gene is known to be the basic unit of heredity. The origins of genetics are to be found in Gregor John Mendel's work on plant hybridization. However, the word genetics was only coined in 1906 to designate the new science of heredity by William Battison. He used the word genetics to designate the science of heredity and variation. He was one of the strong advocates of Mendel's work and became a champion of Mendel's principles of inheritance. The history of genetics dates from the classical era with contributions by Pythagoras, Hippocrates, Aristotle, Epicurus and others. Historical background. The scientific evidence for patterns of genetic inheritance was started from Mendel's work. History indicates that humankind must have been interested in heredity long before the dawn of civilization. This is because of the curiosity based on human family resemblances such as similarity in body structure, voice, gait and gestures. Early nomads used the quality of the animals to breed and domesticate, indicating selective breeding. The first human settlement was practiced farming with selected crop plants with favorable qualities. Besides, ancient tomb paintings show a race horse breeding pedigree indicating the inheritance of several distinct physical traits in the horses. Moreover, the first recorded information on heredity was found during the time of the ancient Greeks. Some of their ideas are still considered relevant today. First, let's discuss the role and contribution of Hippocrates. Hippocrates, known as the father of medicine, believed in the inheritance of acquired characteristics and to account for this, he devised the hypothesis known as pengenesis. He postulated that all organs of the body of a parent gave off invisible seeds which were like miniaturized building components and were transmitted during sexual intercourse resembling themselves in the mother's womb to form a baby. He also proposed that materials from all parts of the body concentrated in male semen. This was then developed into a human in the womb. For example, the massive biceps of an Olympic weightlifter were present as many bicep parts in the semen. Therefore, his children would also have big biceps. Thus, he believed in the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Now, let us discuss the contribution of Aristotle. Aristotle emphasized the importance of blood in heredity. He thought that the blood supplied generative material for building all parts of the adult body and he reasoned that blood was the basis for passing on this generative power to the next generation. In fact, he believed that the male's semen was purified blood and that a woman's menstrual blood was her equivalent of semen. These male and female contributions united in the womb to produce a baby. The blood contained some type of heredity essence, but he believed that the baby would develop 
under the influence of these essences rather than being built from the essences themselves. For both Hippocrates and Aristotle and also all other scholars through to the late 19th century believed that the inheritance of acquired traits was well established fact that any theory of heredity had to explain. In addition to this, individual species were taken to have a fixed essence. Those inherited chains were merely superficial. Later, the Athenian philosopher Epicurus observed families and proposed the contribution of both males and females of heredity characters as sperm atoms. He notes the dominant and recessive types of inheritance and described the segregation and independent assortment of sperm atoms. A mathematical version of pangenesis was developed as the biometrical school of heredity by Darwin's cousin Francis Galton. In between Aristotle and Mendel's time, a new idea was introduced on the nature of heredity in the 17th and 18th centuries as the concept of preformation. Scientists, by using the newly developed microscopes, imagined that they could see miniature replicants of human beings inside sperm heads. Dear students, let's now discuss the contributions of various scientists to the field of genetics. First, the contribution of Van Leeuwenhoek. The major contribution of Van Leeuwenhoek was the significant improvements to the microscope which made him observe what he termed animacules today as microbes or microorganisms. Several scientists considered Van Leeuwenhoek as the father of microbiology because he was the first to report on single cell organisms. Scientists of the day greeted his findings with suspicion and resistance. Only a team of impartial researchers replicated his observations that microbes were accepted as a real phenomena. Therefore, his significant contribution was to initiate a whole field of science that subsequently led to the identification of chromosomes and the development of cell theory. Dear students, let's discuss the contribution of Carl Linnaeus. Carl Linnaeus is most well known as the father of taxonomy for his work on naming and classifying groups of organisms. His proposal fundamentally changed the way that science classifies living things. Learn about Linnaeus' contributions to biology including binomial nomenclature of taxonomy and his written work that is System Nature. Linnaeus is considered the father of taxonomy because in the 1700s he developed a way to name and organize species that we still use today. This is known as binomial nomenclature. His two most important contributions to taxonomy were first the hierarchical classification system, second the system of binomial nomenclature that is naming of methods of the organisms. During his lifetime, Linnaeus collected around 40,000 specimens of plants, animals and shells. He believed it was important to have a standard way of grouping and naming species. So in 1735, he published his first edition of Systema Nature, the system of nature, which was a small pamphlet explaining his new system of the classification of nature. He continued to publish more editions of Systema Nature that included more named species. In total, Linnaeus named 4,400 animal species and 7,700 plant species using his binomial nomenclature system. The 10th edition of Systema Nature was published in 1758 and is considered the most important edition. Its full title in English is System of Nature Through the Three Kingdoms of Nature According to Classes, Orders, Genera and Species with Characters, Differences, Synonyms, 
places. Let us now discuss the contribution made by Lamarck. Jean Papaste Lamarck is one of the best known early evolutionists. Unlike Darwin, Lamarck believed that living things evolved in a continuously upward direction from dead matter through simple to more complex forms towards human perfection. Species did not die out in extinctions, Lamarck claimed instead they changed into other species. Since simple organisms exist alongside complex advanced animals today, Lamarck thought they must be continually created by spontaneous generations. According to Lamarck, organisms altered their behavior in response to environmental change. Their changed behavior in turn modified their organs and their offspring inherited those improved structures. For example, giraffes developed their long elongated necks and front legs by generations of browsing on high tree leaves. The exercise of stretching up to the leaves altered the neck and legs and their offsprings inherited these acquired characteristics. According to Darwin's theory, giraffes that happened to have slightly longer necks and limbs would have a better chance of securing food and thus be able to have more offsprings. The select who survive, conversely, in Lamarck's view, a structure or organ would shrink or disappear if used less or not at all. Driven by these heritable modifications, all organisms would become adaptable or adapted to their environment as those environments changed. Unlike Darwin, Lamarck held that evolution was a constant process of striving towards greater complexity and perfection. Even though this belief eventually gave way to Darwin's theory of natural selection acting on random variations. Lamarck is credited with helping put evolution on the map and with acknowledging that the environment plays a role in shaping the species that live in it. Dear friends, let us now discuss Darwin's contributions. Dear students, Darwin's contributions to evolutionary biology are well known, but his contributions to genetics are much less known. His main contribution was the collection of tremendous amount of genetic data and an attempt to provide a theoretical framework for its interpretation. Darwin clearly described almost all genetic phenomena of fundamental importance such as prepotency that is Mendelian inheritance, bud variation that is mutation, heterosis, reversion that is atavism, graft hybridization, sex limited inheritance, the direct action of the male element on the female that is xenia and telogrony, the effect of use and disuse, the inheritance of acquired characters that is Lamarck's inheritance and many other observations pertaining to variation, heredity and development. To explain all these observations, Darwin formulated a developmental theory of heredity that is pangenesis, which not only greatly influenced many subsequent theories but also is supported by recent evidence. Dear students, let us discuss now about modern genetics. Modern genetics began with the work of Gregor John Mendel on pea plants and established the theory of Mendelian inheritance in 1866. The landmarks in the field of genetics started way back from Robert Hooke with the discovery of cell when he examined a thin slice of cork under the microscope. He thought cells looked like the small rectangular rooms monks lived in. In 1651, William Harvey suggested that all living things originate from eggs. In 1735, Carl Linnaeus proposes the taxonomic system including the naming of homo sapiens. In 1798, 
T.R. Malathas publishes an essay on the principles of population that is foundation of the struggle for existence and the survival of the fittest. Carl Friedrich Burdach in 1800 coined the term biology to denote the study of human morphology, physiology and psychology. In 1809, Jean Bepstein Lemarck puts forward his ideas on evolution and in 1818, W.C. Wells suggests natural selection in African population for their relative resistance to local diseases. And in 1820, C.F. Nessie describes the sex-linked transmission of hemophilia disease in humans. Between 1822 to 1824, T.A. Knight, J. Goss, and A. Seton independently do studies in peas and observe the dominance, recessiveness, and segregation in the first filial generation, but did not detect regularities. In 1828, Carl Ernest von Beer published The Embryology of Animals. In 1831, Robert Brown notes nuclei within cells, and Charles Darwin starts his voyage on HMS Beagle. M. J. Sheldon and T. Shivon in 1839 developed the famous cell theory that all animals and plants are made up of cells and further suggested that growth and reproduction are due to division of cells. In 1840, Martin Barry expresses the belief that the spermatozoan enters the egg and in 1855, Alfred Russell Wells publishes on the law which has regulated the introduction of new species and this was followed by Alfred Russell Wells in 1858 when he sends to Darwin a manuscript on the tendency of varieties to depart indefinitely from the original type. The origins of genetics lie in the development of theories of evolution. It was in 1858 that the origin of species and how species variability was developed after the research work of Charles Darwin and Wells. They had described how new species arose via evolution and how natural selection occurred to evolve new forms of life. They, however, did not know the role of genes had to play in this phenomena. Around the same time, Gregor John Mendel, an Austrian monk, was performing extensive experiments on inheritance and genetics of sweet pea plants. He described the unit of heredity as a particle that does not change and is passed on to offspring. His work is in the fact the basis of understanding the principles of genetics even today. Consequently, Gregor John Mendel is known as the father of genetics. Let's now discuss the Gregor John Mendel's contribution to the field of genetics. Gregor Mendel discovered the basic principles of heredity through experiments with pea plants long before the discovery of DNA and genes. Mendel was able to cross breed the plants by transferring pollen with a paintbrush. He meticulously recorded a range of characteristics for each plant including its height, pod shape, pea shape and pea color. When plants self-fertilized, these characteristics remained consistent in the offsprings. Mendel showed that when two varieties of purebred plants crossbred, the offspring resembled one or other of the parent, not a blend of the two. He found that some traits are dominant and some would always be expressed in a first generation cross, while others are recessive and would not appear in this generation. However, these recessive traits reappear in the next generation if these first generation plants self-fertilize. Mendel hypothesized that parents contribute some particulate substance to offsprings which determine its heritable characteristics. We now know that these particles correspond to genes made up of DNA. 
without any knowledge of the molecules involved, Mendel was able to infer that heritable particles are separated into gametes, eggs and sperms and that offspring inherit one particle from each parent. In 1900, Dutch botanist and genetist Hugo de Averis, German botanist and genetist Karl Erich Korens and Austrian botanist Erich Tescher-Mock won independently reported results of hybridization experiments similar to Mendel's. In Great Britain, biologist William Battison became the leading proponent of Mendel's theory. Around him gathered an enthusiastic band of followers. However, Darwinian evolution was assumed to be based chiefly on the selection of small blending variations, whereas Mendel worked with clearly non-blending variations. Battison soon found that championing Mendel aroused opposition from Darwinians. He and his supporters were called Mendelians and their work was considered irrelevant to evolution. It took some three decades before the Mendelian theory was sufficiently developed to find its rightful place in evolutionary theory. The distinction between a characteristic and its determinant was not consistently made by Mendel or by his successors. The early Mendelians. In 1909, Danish botanist and genetist William Johnson clarified this point and named their determinants as genes. Four years later, American zoologist and genetist Thomas Hutt Morgan located the genes on the chromosome and popular picture of them as beads on a string emerged. This discovery had implications for Mendel's claim of an independent transmission of traits for genes close together on the same chromosome are not transmitted independently. Moreover, as genetic studies pushed the analysis down to smaller and smaller dimensions, the Mendelian gene appeared to fragment. Molecular genetics has thus challenged any attempts to achieve a unified conception of the gene as the elementary unit of heredity. Today, the gene is defined in several ways, depending upon the nature of the investigation. Genetic material can be synthesized, manipulated and hybridized with genetic material from other species, but to fully understand its functions in whole organism, an understanding of Mendelian inheritance is necessary. As the architect of genetic, experimental and statistical analysis, Mendel remains the acknowledged father of genetics. Dear students, let's now discuss some important milestones in the history of genetics. In 1866, Australian botanist Gregor Mendel published the results of his experiments with pea plants. His work later provided the mathematical foundation of the science of genetics. In 1869, Swiss biochemist John Frederick Mischer became the first to isolate nuclein now known as DNA. Although he developed a hypothesis explaining the role of nuclein in heredity, he ultimately concluded that one molecule alone could not provide the level of variation observed in nature within and between species. In 1900, Mendel's experiments were discovered independently by Hugo Davries, Carl Erich Korens and Erich Tescher-Mark, giving rise to the modern science of genetics. In 1928, English bacteriologist Frederick Grips conducted experiments suggesting that bacteria are capable of transferring genetic information and that such transformation is heritable. In 1931, American scientists Harriet B. Craigton and Barbara McClintock published a paper demonstrating that new allelic combinations of linked genes are correlated with physical exchange chromosome paths. Their findings suggested that chromosomes form the basis of genetics. In 1944, 
Canadian born American bacteriologist Oswald Avery and American biologist McLean McCarthy and Colin McLeod reported that the transforming substance, the genetic material of the cells was DNA. In 1951, Austrian born American biochemist Irwin Chargoff discovered that the components of DNA are paired in 1 is to 1 ratio, thus the amount of adenine is always equal to that of the thymine and the amount of guanine is always equal to that of the cytosine. In 1953, British scientists Rosalind Franklin, Morris Wilkins and Raymond Gosling conducted X-ray diffraction studies that provided images of the helical structure of DNA fibers. Using Chargaff's data and the X-ray image recorded by Franklin Wilkins and Gosling, British fire physicists James Watson and Francis Crick determined the molecular structure of DNA. Watson, Crick and Wilkins shared the 1962 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine for their discovery of structure of DNA. In 1960s, Swiss microbiologist Werner Arbor and American microbiologist Hamilton Othanel Smith and Daniel Nathans discovered restriction enzymes which cleave DNA into fragments also known as molecular scissors. The discovery for which the three men shared the 1978 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine enabled scientists to manipulate genes by removing and inserting DNA sequences. In 1970s, American molecular biologist Alan M. Maxam and Walter Gilbert and English biochemist Frederick Sanger developed some of the first techniques for DNA sequencing. Gilbert and Sanger shared the 1980 Nobel Prize for chemistry for their work. In 1980s, American biochemist Carey B. Mullis invented the polymerase chain reaction or PCR, a simple technique that allows a specific stretch of DNA to be copied billions of times in a few hours. Mullis received the 1993 Nobel Prize for Chemistry for his invention. In 1990s, the Human Genome Project or HGP began. By the time of its completion in 2003, HGP researchers had successfully determined, stored, and rendered publicly available the sequence of almost all the genetic content of the human genome. Dear students, it was all about the landmarks in the field of human genetics. Now let us discuss some of the important scientists who received Nobel Prize in the field of genetics. 1910 Nobel Prize went to Albrecht Kossel. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for his chemical descriptions of deoxyribonucleic acids or DNA and ribonucleic acids that's RNA. Thanks to his research, the world learned about the nitrogenous bases that comprise DNA and RNA. Adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine and uracil often represented by a, T, G, C, and U, respectively. In 1933, Nobel Prize went to the Thomas H. Morgan. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work studying the way that heritable information is organized and passed on to the next generation. His famous fly room at Columbia University produced numerous foundational discoveries in the nascent field of genetics and some terminology around mapping genetic information is named after him. In 1958, Nobel Prize went to George Wells Beadle, Edward Lavery Totem, and Joshua Lidberg. They were awarded the Nobel Prize for their research findings showing that DNA sequences contain information required to make proteins. Your DNA is a series of nucleotides which when aligned in a specific pattern spell out a code. This code contains information that instructs cells 
on how to build proteins and how to function. In short, DNA contains instructions for building the life of an organism. In 1959, Nobel Prize went to Severo Ocha and Arthur Kornberg. They were awarded the Nobel Prize for their work describing how new copies of DNA and RNA are made. Saviro Ochoa was the first to make RNA in a test tube using an enzyme from bacteria. Arthur Kornberg, one of Ochoa's former students, later isolated and identified the enzyme that makes new copies of DNA. Aside from the discoveries themselves, the methods they used to methodically isolate and purify enzyme activity defined a generation of biochemists with several of their academic children and Kornberg's actual children winning later Nobel Prize of their own. In 1962, Nobel Prize went to Francis Crick, James Watson and Morse Wilkins. Crick, Watson and Wilkins are perhaps some of the most well-known Nobel laureates. Roseland, Franklin and Morris Wilkins used an advanced technology known as X-ray crystallography to generate abstract images, something you can try at home as well based on the way that X-rays are scattered as they pass through DNA. Using the data from Franklin and Wilkins, Watson and Crick were able to determine the double-stranded structure of DNA. This structure is the basis for how information in DNA is stored, copied, and assessed. The 1968 Nobel went to Robert W. Hole, Hargobind Khurana, and Marshall W. Nirenberg. They were awarded the Nobel Prize for their collective findings describing how information in DNA sequence is coded. Scientists had previously known the DNA contained information for making proteins, but the code itself was not yet known. Thanks to the work of these scientists, we now understand that DNA sequences are segmented into discrete three base units known as codons. Codons are the equivalent of words in a sentence. Codons are placed together to spell out a sentence which in this analogy would equate to a protein. The 1980 Nobel Prize went to Paul Berg, Walter Gilbert and Frederick Sanger. They were awarded the Nobel Prize for their role in developing scientific methods that allow us to determine the sequence of DNA. Reading the DNA sequence allows us to understand how many genes we have and what they do. We still use the basic concept of this method today. The interesting side of this is that this was Sanger's second Nobel Prize. In 1958, he won the Nobel Prize for studying the structure of proteins and insulin. The 1993 Nobel Prize went to Barbara McClintock. She was awarded the Nobel Prize for her work describing the ability of DNA to move between locations within the genome. Her studies using maize, a type of corn, introduced the scientific world to a new notion. Small segments of DNA can be moved to other regions and that some genes directly influence the activity of other genes. These mobile DNA elements are left over from a virus millions of years ago and they have helped shape our evolution by making extra copies of some genes and breaking others. The concept of genetic regulation that she discovered might seem mundane today but it was a decade before other researchers would replicate the discovery in bacteria. These were called as jumping genes. The 1993 Nobel went to Carrie B. Mills and Michael Smith. They were awarded the Nobel Prize for their work in establishing scientific methods that allows us to study particular regions of the DNA. Mills developed a technique known as PCR. 
This method is used to make numerous copies of a specific D regions of DNA which allows us to study DNA from a small sample and is currently used throughout biomedical sciences. Smith determined how to introduce specific changes in a given DNA sequence. Having this ability helps us to study specific DNA variants in the lab and ultimately determine how changes in the DNA affect a protein's function. The 2006 Nobel Prize went to Roger Kornberg, the son of Arthur Kornberg, who shared the 1959 Nobel Prize. Roger Kornberg won for his work in describing and imaging proteins responsible for reading DNA. At the time of this discovery, the physical mechanisms by which cells read the DNA to make proteins was unclear. Using complex imaging techniques, Roger Kornberg imagined multiple steps in this process and shed invaluable light on a critical processes found in all living organisms. The 2009 Nobel Prize went to Elizabeth Blackburn, Carol Greeder, and Jack Suzotak. They were awarded the Nobel Prize for their work describing the structure and maintenance of telomeres, regions of DNA located at the ends of the chromosomes. Telomeres are similar in concept to the plastic caps on the ends of shoelaces. They protect the DNA from wear and tear during the process of making a new cell. This process is inherently flawed because every time a cell replicates, small portions of DNA are deleted from the chromosome ends. This would be catastrophic for a cell, but telomeres serve as a buffer zone, a disposable DNA sequence that can be incrementally deleted while having little effect on cell death. Telomeres and the proteins that replenish them have since been shown to play critical roles in human health. The recently 2017 awarded Nobel Prize went to Jeffrey C. Hall, Michael Rochebash, and Michael W. Young. Once again, research with a genetic impact is taking center stage as the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was awarded to Jeffrey C. Hall, Michael Rochebash, and Michael W. Young for foundational research describing our inner circadian clock the mechanism in our body that drives wakefulness and sleepiness. This research set the stage for numerous scientific advancements in the field of circadian rhythms. So understanding genetic factors and genetic disorders is important in learning more about promoting health and preventing diseases. In future, genetic testers will routinely predict individual susceptibility to diseases. Diagnosis of many conditions will be much more through and specific than now. New drugs derived from a detailed molecular understanding of common illness like diabetes and high blood pressure will target molecules logically. Dear students, it was all about today's lecture regarding landmarks in the history of genetics. Hope you have understood it well. See you next time with a new topic. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.